Revelation chapter 4. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardis in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns was on their head. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever and will cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and because of your will they exist and were created. He is worthy of worship today. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you're worthy. We're thankful that you're you're not only worthy, but you're faithful. That, God, you've been so faithful to each and every one of us who are here that we move, we breathe, we, we have our being because you will it to be so. And, Father, you willed us to be here today. We're not here by accident. And, Father, we're here to praise your name, to lift you up, to see you exalted, to see you on your throne. And, Father, if we can just do that, then we'll leave here changed because we've had an encounter with the living God. But Father, we need your spirit in order to see you, in order to know you, in order to, Father, worship you the way that you're worthy. We've got to do that in truth and in spirit. So Father, we're asking today that you would pour your spirit out on us, Father, that you would enable us to see you as you are, the great, immortal, invisible eternal, all-wise, all-powerful, all-knowing God and creator, and we praise you today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I want to take uh, just a moment to tell you, well, first of all, how glad that I am to be here. I tell you, I am thankful to be at a church like Bel Air Baptist Church. Uh, just constantly, constantly people tell me how wonderful the fellowship at Bel Air Baptist Church is. And I keep telling them, well, you know, you tell me something I already know. But it is a wonderful place to be, and you all are very loving people. And it's good to be together today and, and to worship the living God. I want to take just a moment to welcome our guests. I've already met a few that's here the first time, and, and there's probably others that I've not met. And whether it's your first time, second, third time, if you've never done this, we'd like to ask you to do something for us. And that's on the worship bulletin that hopefully you receive coming in the door. On the right-hand side is a tab that provides a place for you to fill some information out about yourself. If you would do that, tear it off, drop it in the offering plate when it comes by, we would consider that your gift to us. We are so honored that you're here today. If you're here and you're a guest, we've prayed for you, we've been expecting you, and, and you are a gift to us. And our prayer is that you will be blessed from the moment you step on our campus till the moment that you leave. Now, these good-looking men down front here, they want to give you a gift, and it has a pen that you uh, can use and, and keep uh, to fill out that information that we requested. But this is a gift package from us. tells you a little bit about Bel Air. So if you're here today, and if you would, just slip, if you're a guest and you haven't received one, just slip your hand up in there and let these guys get it in your hand up in the balcony. All right. Anybody? Don't want to miss anybody. Okay. Well, thank you for being here, and let's just have a good time worshiping the living God.
Truly, nothing does compare to the promises that we have in you, Father. You said that if any man would seek you with all of his heart, Father, that you would let us find you, Father. That Jesus would become Lord of our lives, Father. That, Father, we would surrender everything to you, Father. We have so much to celebrate this day, Father, Lord. The day you've given us with life in our lungs, Father, Lord, just to live for you, Father. The wedding this afternoon between Garrett and Chelsea, Father, Lord. 
but truly the greatest celebration of all, Father, is that you sent your Son, Father, who knew no sins, Father, and in the flesh condemned all sin, Father, that we would not be under the law of sin, Father, but under the law of grace. Father, I know how we love you, Father, and how we praise you, Father. Father, I pray that your Spirit would just be here and anoint this service today, Father. Lord, that we would serve you better, Father, and love you more, Father. Father, we are weak in the flesh, Lord, but your Spirit makes us strong, Father. We just ask you bless this day, Father, for your glory, Father. That the name of Jesus Christ would be exalted, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> read to you from Psalms 40. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cries. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction and out of the miry clay. He set my feet upon the rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth and a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust. It has not turned to the proud, nor to those who lapse in falsehood. Many, O oh Lord my God, are the wonders which you have done, and thy thoughts towards us. There is none to compare with thee. If I would de declare and speak of them, they would be too numerous to count. If you are able, will you kneel with us as we pray? Our dear, gracious, heavenly Father, Lord God, 
Lord, to count the ways of your goodness. Lord, they're without number. Lord, we know you're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lord, you're our great provider. The, the word says that every good thing we have comes from you above. Lord, you loved us so much, Lord, that you sent your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Lord, you watched him be completely obedient to you on here on earth. Lord, as he turned away from sin, Lord, as he was tempted, Lord God, Lord, he used your words to fight those temptations. Lord, and he walked obedient to you into the point of death and death on the cross. The only perfect lamb Lord, and he was beaten and bruised. Lord, but he's resurrected. Lord, he's defeated death and hell. And he is sitting at your right hand right now, Lord. And we thank you for that, Lord God. Lord, only, only, only can we be saved through Christ. Lord, you have put a new song in my heart, as many others in this room as well. Lord, but there's still work to be done. Lord, let us, as the body of Christ, Lord, through this worship, be projected into this world to share the good news of the gospel. Lord, don't let us hide these things from our friends and from our neighbors, from our own family. Lord, let us shout it on the mountaintops that Jesus is Lord. Lord, I pray that we remember the great and mighty things you've done, how you have put us on the rock, and now our steps are firm. been known to come up prematurely and then when I start singing when I'm up here they ask me to sit back down I appreciate Alan Alan brings us into God's presence the musicians acquire I tell you folks uh, if you don't appreciate what God's doing at Bel Air then you've not been around the other churches and while I I've been in situations where I had to lead the singing sometimes a cappella and then preach the message and I really appreciate uh, how everybody here uses the diversity of gifts that God has given us. If you haven't already done so, would you turn in your copy of God's Word to 1 Samuel chapter 15. That's in the Old Testament. If you find uh, Judges in the book of Ruth, hang a right. If you find 1 2 Kings, 1 2 Chronicles, hang a left. And right in the middle of all that, you'll find 1 2 Samuel. For the benefit of our guests, we've been preaching a four-part sermon series on the life of Saul, the first king of Israel. This is our third message. And we have summarized that Saul's life can be summarized by the way of the slippery slope. The slippery slope, uh, 
It's a phrase that I coined that was written by C.S. Lewis in his book, The Screw Tape Letters. When the head demon, Screw Tape, wrote a letter to Wormwood, the apprentice demon, on how to lead someone astray, and Screw Tape said to Wormwood, said the most surest path to hell is by way of the slippery slope. One that's gentle underfoot with no advance warning, no warning signs, gent filled with gentle bends and curves so that the traveler doesn't see the final destination until they finally just drop off into hell. I think that's a good description of Saul's life. And we've been following Saul on the slippery slope. And today's message is part three on the slippery slope, the message about selective obedience. I have never, to my knowledge, talked to anyone who ever said to me, Pastor, I woke up one morning and I determined that I was going to charter a course that would ruin my life. I just woke up one morning, I had a fine marriage. Our marriage was strong, and I said something about that morning. I said, you know what, I'm going to uh, begin to consciously do things that will end my marriage in divorce, for example. That's not the way it works, is it? We get to where we get by way of the slippery slope. Just little wrong turns. And we've been following Saul on that journey. You know, folks, we need to realize today that we have a real enemy. Yeah. His name is Satan. Yeah. And he wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And I promise each one that's here today, everybody here, the devil wants to destroy your home. He wants to destroy your marriage. He wants to destroy the lives of your children. He wants to destroy anything that's good and noble about you. The devil wants to destroy it. And in America, it is my considered opinion that he most often accomplishes what he does by way of the slippery slope. In chapter 13, Saul did not give God unconditional obedience and unconditional service, and that began his journey on the slippery slope. We saw in that chapter in our first message the uh, punishment that it brought Saul. And then in chapter 14, he traveled on down the slippery slope around the next bend, and we saw the religious hypocrisy of Saul. And we saw that he only called on God when it was in his advantage to call on God, that he didn't really love God, and how that Saul became filled with his own self-importance, that everything was about him. And today, the slippery slope becomes a little steeper. He begins his journey towards hell a little quicker, as now the slippery slope, as we will see today, is going to lead Saul into outright rebellion against God. You know, folks, you've heard the saying, but it really is true, that sin will always take you further than you wanted to go. It'll always keep you longer than you wanted to stay, and it will always, I repeat, always cost you more than you wanted to pay. And that's what we need to understand, that no one just wakes up and says, I want to ruin my life. If I asked anyone here today, who wants to go to hell? If anybody raised their hand, I would ask, suggest that you go check yourself into the insane asylum. Yeah. Nobody here is saying, I, I intend to go to hell. We get there one little wrong step at a time. Saul, we're going to find today, we're going to find out today that Saul is Satan's man. I hope that I am not doing him an injustice by identifying him as such. But personally, I believe when one rightly reads the scripture about Saul, I personally do not believe that he was ever saved. And I believe that Saul actually embodies the image of what a hypocrite truly is. He pretended to be God's man, but in reality, he was Satan's man. And Saul's a warning to us today. He's a warning to all of us who maybe we sit in church week in and, and week out and we claim to follow God. But yet we are still to give ourselves unreservedly to God. We're still holding something back. Trying to follow God on our terms. Now I want you to keep your Bibles open today to the 15th chapter of 1 Samuel as we work our way through this passage. I want you to see the path of the slippery slope 
that selective obedience to God is the same as outright rebellion. I want us to notice, first of all, in verses 1 through 9, that God will not honor selective obedience. Now, we understand what I mean by the term selective obedience, don't we? It's what my wife accuses me of having, and your wife, guys, accuse you of having in the way of hearing. My wife says, I have selective hearing. I only hear what I want to hear. You know, and, and Gary Weatherly will not wear his, uh, his uh, hearing aids. You got them in today, brother? So I don't have to shout today. And I fuss at him for not wearing his hearing aids, but I think maybe he's just smarter than the rest of us. It allows him to have selective hearing. Well, a lot of us want to carry that into our obedience with God. We want to have selective obedience. And I want you to first of all see with me these first nine verses. God will not honor selective obedience. Notice in the 15th chapter of 1 Samuel, it says, When Samuel said to Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek, for what he did to Israel, how he set himself against him on the way while he was coming up from Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has. Do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, and sheep and camel and donkey. Then Saul summoned the people, numbered them in uh, Talem, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 men of Judah. Saul came to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the valley. Saul said to the Canaanites, go depart, go down from among the people. Yeah, let me find, I lost my place. Go down from among the Amalekites so that I do not destroy you with them for you showed kindness to all the sons of Israel when they came up from Egypt, so the Canaanites departed from among the Amalekites. So Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havalah all the way to Sur, which is east of Egypt. He captured, notice he captured Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly, but everything despised and worthless, that they utterly destroyed. I want you to notice in verse 3, could God's instructions to Saul have been any more clear? Could they possibly have been any more explicit, any more clear, nothing ambiguous? The the instructions were clear. Your instructions, Saul, your marching order, Saul, are to go down to the Amalekites and utterly destroy everything. Everything is under the ban. Everything is to be destroyed. And God's commandments, why it sounds strange to us as we just uh, come into Scripture at this point, they are being driven by what we see in Deuteronomy chapter 25. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, God spoke through Moses and he told Israel then that when they had come into the land and when God had given them rest from all their enemies, they were to remember what the Amalekites tried to do to Israel when they were in the wilderness. They tried to destroy Israel and God told them in Deuteronomy 25, when you're in the land and you have rest from your enemies, you shall utterly wipe them out. You see, God knew, God knew that if these people, if these Amalekites were permitted to live, they would cause more uh, trouble in the future than the Israelites could possibly imagine. In fact, we see that Saul did spare some of them and we're going to meet one of them. You'll meet one of them later. Some of the descendants of the Amalekites, you'll meet later in the book of Esther. You remember the book of Esther? Do you remember a man by the name of Haman who tried and would have totally destroyed the Hebrew nation had God not intervened? Haman was a direct descendant of the Amalekites. God knew this. And brothers and sisters, I'm here to tell you something. That if we had God's perspective, 
we would understand God's immediate actions. If we knew what God knew, maybe what God tells us sometimes to do that seems so strange to us would make more sense. But on the other hand, just because we do not possess God's perspective, it does not mean that God's immediate commands are misguided or something that we can ignore or alter. You and I, if I may just say it candidly, are not God. Some of us need to realize that today. We're not God. And because we're not God, we're not entitled to make God's decisions for him. Amen? God is all-knowing. God is all-wise. And when he told Saul to utterly wipe out the Amalekites and everything, God knew what he was doing. But I want you to notice in verse 4 through 7, so far Saul is doing pretty good. He's like a lot of us. He starts off well. But you know it's not how you start. It's how you finish, isn't it? He starts off well in verse 4 through 7. He began well. So far through verse 7, he's being obedient. He's, he's going down there. He's mustering the forces, and, and he's heading that way. But I want you to notice in verse 8 and 9 that that's where things go terribly, terribly wrong. Verse 8 and 9 the Bible says he didn't kill Agag, the king. He captured him. I'll, I'll mention, if I don't forget a little later, of why that was. But he captured Agag. And then it goes on and says that in verse 9, they spared him, and they also spared the best of the animals. And what they did in following God's command, did you notice at the end of verse 9 what they did? Everything that was worthless, Everything that was of no account, everything that was of no value, that they destroyed. Can I tell you something? God had, I mean, Saul had absolutely no right to spare anything. He didn't have the right. You and I don't have the right to modify the word of God. We've got churches and denominations today that want to argue over the word of God. They want to pick and choose the word of God. We don't have the right to modify the word of God. We take it as it comes in its entirety. But Saul, he treats the word of God like some of us do. He gets down there and God gives him a great deliverance and God blesses. And Saul begins to think, what a shame. What a shame to destroy everything. Well, look at that registered black Angus bull over there. I used to raise black Angus cattle. I'm just relating it a little bit in my own depravity. What a shame to kill that nice fat bull. But God gives us this account because God wants us to know something, that God will not honor selective obedience. He will not honor the selective obedience that so many of us that are right here today are trying to offer him. I'll obey you, Lord. I'll obey you, Lord until it cost me something. Oh, I'll obey you, Lord, up to a certain point. I'll obey you, Lord, with my leftovers. Have I started meddling yet? I'll obey you, Lord, as long as it makes sense to me. I mean, how many of us truthfully Try offering up to God selective obedience. And do you know why we offer up to God selective obedience? It's because we're not offering up an obedience to God that's out of love, out of gratitude for his blessings in our life and what he's done for us. We're offering up selective obedience with misguided motives because we're trying to get something for us out of it. Amen? Amen. That's why we hold anything back from God. We think it's going to be a blessing in it for me if I don't give it all to God. For example, we can come to church. I'm glad you're here today. I thought the crowd's going to be way off. I don't know where y'all come from the time I get up to preach. Well, we can come to church and not truly worship. We can, we can come and not truly worship God and give him everything unreservedly. We can come to church just for what we can get out of it. It makes me feel good. 
You, you know these people because every time they don't get what they want, they either cause a problem in the church or they leave the church. But we can come to church for the wrong motives. We, 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 can, we, can, uh, we can do it in many ways. It takes on so many forms. I mean, we, we could just go on for a long time. We, we could talk about how, how we we'll tell God, we'll tithe, God, until God gives us that really big windfall. You know, we, maybe we're on commissions or something and we make that sale of a lifetime and all of a sudden we get that big check and, and, and we'll tithe, Lord, but surely you don't want me to give 10% of this big windfall. And now we're getting into some serious money here, God. The story's told about the man that used to have struggled with tithing and he worked and talked to his pastor about tithing and, and, and finally God gave the man the faith, the courage. He started tithing and God just started blessing his life and a few years went by and the man was tithing of everything. And then he finally got that great big promotion and his business was doing great and all of a sudden he's making more money in his life and now he's making six figures and he gets set down. He gets to thinking, man, if I keep tithing, I'll have to tithe fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year. And he comes to this pastor and says, Pastor, I can't give that kind of money. You, you need to pray with me. I, I can't give that kind of money. So the pastor prayed, God, would you please cut his income back to 40000 so he can tithe? <laughs> Amen? Amen? Selective obedience, people. God will not honor selective obedience. It, it's not up for negotiation. But I want you to notice secondly, Secondly, selective obedience always brings a change in God's dealing with a person. If, if you're here today, and I suspect a lot of us are, and God's laying things on your heart and you have not obeyed God, that's selective obedience. Oh, I, 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 I'm not, I'll give him everything, but I'm not going to give him what I'm watching on my computer when I'm alone. Yeah. I'll give him everything, but I'm not giving him up to drinking and to partying. Whatever, you can fill in the blank. I'll give him everything, but I'm still hanging on to that spirit of unforgiveness because of what somebody did to me. I want you to notice something, that if that describes you, selective obedience always brings a change in God's dealing with a person. Look with me in verse 10 through 21. Notice in verse 10 and 11 what God says through Samuel to Saul. Then the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I regret. Your translation may say, I, 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 I repent or, or I uh, uh, am turning from. It all means the same thing. Verse 10, he says, I regret that I've made Saul king for he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. Now I want to, tell you something. God says, I regret making Saul king not because God has changed. Saul's the one who's changed, amen? Saul's the one. He said, Saul's the one that's turned back from following me. Saul has sinned against God. Saul is persisting in sinning against God, so God now must deal with him accordingly. It's obvious to anyone that, that knows anything scripturally about God, it's obvious that God cannot undergo change of any kind. He cannot undergo change in disposition. He cannot go change, uh, through change in, in motive. God is perfect, for example, in kindness. He is infinitely kind in all of his dealing and all of his dealings with his creatures. He'll always have his creatures' welfare in view. God not only is infinite in kindness, he's infinite in wisdom. We, we haven't figured this out, but, but God can have no better plan than his original plan. There is no plan B with God. There's only plan A. God is impossible for him to have a better plan than his original plan. Did it ever occur to you, the old saying goes, that nothing's ever occurred to God? God's never had a second thought that was better than his first thought. God is infinite in his wisdom. And therefore, whenever God speaks or the Bible speaks of God regretting or God repenting, he's speaking of a change of his dealings with a man. 
his change in his dealing with a man or a woman, which are the results of the change in that man or woman's attitude towards God. And I'm here to tell you today that if your relationship with God is changed, if God's not as dear and near as he used to be, if God's not precious to you the way he used to be, God hasn't changed. You've changed. You've changed something about your attitude towards God. You see, God is immutable. That means he's unchangeable. His attitude's the same today as it was ages and eons ago, as it will be the same at the end of time. God will never change, and you need to be glad of that because if you're in Christ today, God says that you are justified, you are saved, that you are his child, and 100 billion trillion years of God, God will not change his attitude towards you. That's good news that he doesn't change. If you're in right relationship with God, it's really bad news if you're in bad relationship with God. God alters his dealings with a person in consequence to the man or the woman, and it's not God who changes. He's unchangeable. Now notice in our text that God has rejected Saul as king over the Israel. God hasn't changed. Saul's the one who's refused to walk in obedience to God. God's plan is still plan A. God told Saul when he anointed him king through Samuel, he'd bless him, that he'd always have somebody set on the throne from his family if he would obey him. Saul's the one who's changed. And brothers and sisters, the very purpose of the judgment of God it as always includes a continuance on part of the sinner of that conduct, the very conduct that has invoked the judgment of God. It's always driven, the judgment of God, by that sinner's continuance in that action. We're going to see as we work through this that Saul is filled, he's just filled with a sense of his own self-importance. Look in verse 12. It says, Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul. And it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself. Did you see that? He set up a monument for himself, and then he turned and proceeded to go down to Gilgal. You know a sure sign that you're on the slippery slope? Is that you're just full of yourself. You think everything's all about you. Do you know why he spared King Agag? Because back then, military leaders would spare the king so they could bring the king shackled and bound back before his people and parade him around in front of the people and put their chest out and say, look at me. Look at what I did. Well, Agag was supposed to be dead. He wasn't supposed to be brought back and he's full full of his own self-importance that he even comes back and sets up a monument to himself. I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters. Our problem, that ought to be a warning to us. Our problem isn't that we think too highly of God. Our problem isn't that we put our hands up in the air too high when we start exalting God in worship. Our problem isn't that we think too highly of God. Our problem is we think too highly of ourselves. Our problem isn't that we take God too seriously. Our problem is we take ourselves too serious. And this is Saul. But notice as we look at verse 13 through 15, I want you to listen now. Just listen to Saul as he begins to double talk. And he begins to uh, lay out all this deception in an attempt to camouflage his sinful conduct. Verse 13, Samuel came to Saul and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have carried out the commands of the Lord. Well, has he? Well, he said he did. Surely he must be right. I have people tell me all the time, Pastor, I love the Lord. Living with somebody I'm not married with, but I love the Lord. Well, they must love the Lord. They said they did. Amen? He said, I've carried out the commands of the Lord, verse 14, but Samuel said, what then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears? and the lowing of the oxen which I hear. And Saul said, they, if you mark in your Bible, that's worth marking, they. 
They have brought them from the Amalekites for, underline the people, the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord. This would be worth circling your God. But the rest, we, now he includes himself because he's on the obedient part. But the rest we have utterly destroyed. He didn't have nothing to do with the disobedient part. You know, it's always somebody else's fault, amen, when we, when we try to justify our conduct, our sin against God. It's always somebody else's fault. And Saul had a very pious reasoning for sparing the king and, and the best of the animals. He wanted to have some excellent animals to sacrifice to God. Well, that, of course, was an outright lie. That was an outright lie. It was an attempt to cover up his disobedience. You know, as we sit here on this side of Calvary, this side of the resurrection, Saul was anointed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us if we know Christ Jesus. We know, as Paul Harvey says, the rest of the story. It would behoove us today, brothers and sisters, friends, to hear afresh the word of the Lord Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 15, when Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. We are to look at Saul, we are to see something, that human potential for self-deception has absolutely no bounds. There is no limit to the, the, to the degree that we can delude ourselves and do self-justification for our rebellion against God. It, it just knows no, no limits. And we all, if, if we would be honest today, we all have a tendency to cover up our evil ways with pious pretense. Lord, I'm being disobedient in my finances now. But Lord, if you just give me that big raise. Lord, if I could just get that big promotion that I've been coveting so long. Lord, I'd start being obedient in my finances then. Lord, just think about all the glory you'd receive. If I got that big promotion. Is any of this sounding familiar? We can put a different face on it. You get the point. We all can be very pious, sometimes in our justification for our selective obedience to God. Notice Saul's obedience when it was discovered. He tried to bring blame uh, other people for what happened. It's kind of like the old Flip Wilson. I'm showing my age, but... If you remember the old Flip Wilson variety show, he always had Geraldine on there and she always said, the devil made me do it. The devil made her do everything. That's, that's the way we are. Listen, the devil might tempt you. The devil doesn't make you do anything. Notice what he does in verse 16. When Samuel said to Saul, wait and let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak. And Samuel said, it is, is it not true that you were little? In your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribes of Israel and the Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission. And he said, go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them till they are exterminated. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? but rushed upon the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Then Samuel, Saul said to Samuel, I did, obey the I did obey the voice of the Lord. And I went on the mission on which the Lord sent me, and I have brought back Agag, the king of Amalekite, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. That sounds like people in Washington, doesn't it? I know it came out of my mouth, but I really didn't say that. I went on the mission, I brought back Agag, but I utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Verse 21, but the people took some of the, the people took some of the spoil, the sheep, the oxen, the choicest of things devoted to destruction, 
to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. Saul was the king, not the people. Saul was the one anointed by God when he was little in his own sight and given the responsibility of seeing that the word of the God was obeyed. It's like this, men. I want every man in here to look at me. God has anointed you as a spiritual leader of your home. You are the one responsible. Not your wife, not your children, not your children's soccer and ball schedules, not their school schedules, not the way you was raised, not your parents. You will stand before God one day and you will give an account for the mission that God sent you on of leading your home. And it's not going to do you any good to stand before God and blame the other people because God's going to say to you what he said to Saul. I want you to note well something here. I want you to note well what Saul said to Samuel. He said it twice. Look in verse 15c. He said to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Look in verse 21c. He says to Samuel, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. Not, not my God, did Saul say. Not our God, did Saul say. Can I tell you that a selective obedience characterizes your life? But just like Saul, it very well may be a telltale sign that you don't even know the Lord at all. Saul is here by slip of tongue, I think, admitting he doesn't even know God. Could it be that for some of us, all this self-justification and all these areas of our lives that we keep for ourselves, could it be that the selective obedience in, that so characterizes our life is a telltale sign that we do not know the living God? I mean, many people come to church week in and week out. We want them to come. A lot of people go through the ritualistic motions like we've seen Saul go through. Yet they leave the same church service that some people leave here filled with the Spirit of God and filled with the joy of Christ. They leave week after week as unchanged as when they came. And I want to ask you why. Let's just think about Saul. Let's think about David that will succeed Saul. Let's think about him. There you have the first two kings of Israel, Saul and David. Both of them had Samuel for their preacher and their pastor. They couldn't blame it on the pastor. Both of them were anointed kings of Israel. Both of them had great privilege in life. Both of them began in the beginning of a very humble estate. Yet Saul died and went to hell. And David died and went to heaven. One man, David, God said, was a man after his own heart. The other man, Saul, was a man who only cared about his own heart and his own desires. And I ask you why? Because Saul never did give everything he had to God, as we're going to see. And our last and closing point. I just want you to understand something. Selective obedience, not giving God everything, is nothing to be trifled with. You see, we, we in our day and age minimize sin. We don't even call it sin anymore. We only make mistakes now. We only have lapses in judgment. Well, let us read on and see what God thinks about that. Thirdly and last, I want you to see that selective obedience will always be judged harshly by God. It will always be judged harshly by God. Look at verse 22, 23. Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination. That's witchcraft. And insubordination as the as 
is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you from being king. You know, can I tell you, this is one of the most remarkable passages in all the Bible. It, it, it is remarkable. This is God's rejection of Saul as king on the basis of rebellion and disobedience. And what an important message for us today. And I want you to note that God calls it what it is, doesn't he? You see, we call it being human. We call it just being who I am. And we justify it all we can, just like Saul tries to justify it. But we better look at select obedience the way God looks at it, amen? We better look at it through God's eyes. And God gave us this passage so we'd see it and call it what he sees and calls it. What is it? He says it's rebellion. He says it's insubordination. He says it is rejection of God's word. Now think about that. We say we're people of the book. We say we love the Bible. But anytime you read God's word and you read it selectively and you ignore the part that pricks your heart and you say, I'm just going to pretend I didn't see that. The Bible says you're rejecting his word. You can't just partially receive the word. He said, Saul, you rejected my word. And we live in a day and age where we take way too friendly approach to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is my friend. He's my bud. Well, I'll even put a sticker on my car. Jesus is my co-pilot. Jesus is my friend. I want to ask you, what do you mean when you say that? What are you trying to say? Let me clarify why I asked by way of example. If I said about the President of the United States, the President of the United States is a friend of mine. I am trying to bring the President down to my level. And I think sometimes when we say Jesus is my friend, that's what we're doing. We're trying to bring Jesus down off his throne and glory to our level. Now, if the President of the United States said Randy Hommel is a friend of mine, he's bringing me up to his level, right? What did Jesus say on the subject? Well, I'm glad you asked. Jesus said in John chapter 15, I want you to watch this. Jesus said, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Jesus didn't say he was your friend if you do what he commands you. He said, you're my friends. If you do what I command you, no longer do I call you slaves for the slave does not know what his master is doing. I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from the Father, I have made known to you. What Jesus is doing by allowing us to know what he wants from us, by giving us the ability to obey all his commands, he's bringing us up closer to his level. We'll never be God, but we can be sons of God. We can be inheritance of God. And Jesus is bringing us up by calling us his friend. Nowhere does, does he the Bible say Jesus is my friend. We, we don't put up with it in the workplace. I used to be in business management 23 years. I never once had an employee that I gave them a clear command that they could obey and them do half of it and come to me and say, well, I just didn't feel like doing the other half. I, I just didn't make sense to me. And if we wouldn't put up with it from creature to creature on the human level, how do we expect the holy, exalted, uh, immortal, invisible, all-wise God whose commands we are perfectly able to carry out like Saul was, how do we expect God to accept our partial obedience? That's the question before us today, isn't it? And he comes and he says to Saul, listen, Saul, Obedience is better than sacrifice. You ever ask yourself why? Why does God think obedience is better than the sacrifice of even good sheep and ox and cattle? Because you see, when you give your will, you submit your will to somebody else's will. In other words, by being obedient, you're submitting your will to theirs. You're giving that person all that you are. 
And when you give yourself unreservedly to God, you're giving God the best thing that you can give him. You're giving him your a power of soul and body. You're giving him your material possessions. You're giving him everything about you and God grins a big smile because God said, that's what I was wanting all along. And brothers and sisters, God is looking for something far more precious, far more acceptable than religious ritual and religious acts. He's looking for inside out religion something that flows from a heart that's given wholly to him. I want to ask you as we're closing, I'm very serious. Are you totally obedient to Christ? I want to ask you this. What did the Holy Spirit just bring across your mind when I asked you that? Seriously, what came to your mind? That act that God's been dealing with you about that you keep doing, what? Not forgiving somebody? What, what did the Holy Spirit bring to your mind? And unless we do something about what the Holy Spirit brings to our minds today, do we dare, do we dare to call ourselves a friend of Jesus? Well, I got some really good news. It's really important. We're talking about being rightly related to God. We're talking about knowing Jesus Christ. We're talking about when you know Jesus Christ, he said, not only I'll save you, but I'll give you a changed heart, a heart that will flow with total obedience. You see, that's what makes the difference in Christianity. It's what makes it different from religion, any religion. You can be a, a Buddhist and not know Buddha. You can follow Confucius and not know Confucius. You can follow any of the world religion founders and not know them, but you cannot be a Christian without knowing Jesus Christ. And to know Jesus Christ is to love him. And to love Jesus Christ is to obey him unreservedly. And you can know the Lord Jesus Christ before you leave here today. The Bible says in Romans 5.8, God demonstrated his love towards us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, here's the deal. You may not know him, but he knows you. You may not love him today, but he loves you. You may be here today and you're lost and you are currently under the wrath of God. That is not God's will for your life. You will only remain under the wrath of God if you persist in that behavior, in the path that you are going. But if you will change and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life, God will change his dealings with you. You will go from wrath to mercy. You'll go from hell to heaven. You'll go from being lost to being found. And that's good news. So here's what we're asking you to do as Alan comes. I'm asking you today if you're here. I'm not asking if you're religious. I'm not asking if you can put on a good show like Saul. I'm not asking you if you can quote Bible verses. I'm not asking you if you're a member of church. I'm not asking you if you've been baptized. I'm asking you, do you know by the change in your heart and the conduct of your life, do you know that you know that you know that you know the Lord Jesus Christ in salvation? Well, we'd love for you to come because all you have to do is come to the end of yourself, confess your sin, agree with God that you're a sinner, believe that Jesus died on the cross and what he did on the cross was sufficient payment for your sins and trusting in what Christ did on the cross for you and nothing else, none of your goodness. You give him your life. You give him your heart and accept what he did on the cross. And the Bible says you will be saved. You will be saved, not might. And when you're saved, then God will change your heart. He'll give you his spirit. And then you can start obeying him because you've been set free. And for the first time in your life, you can give him unreserved obedience. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that in a minute. If you'll come, we'll have counselors. They'll take you out back. We won't embarrass you. And in private, show you, pray with you how you can accept the Lord Jesus Christ. You may be here today and you're a believer. You know you're saved, but you know what? 
You started down a slippery path that you didn't intend to go and God's brought something to your mind. Right now is the time for you to deal with that. Don't you keep going down that road. It's going to lead to no good. And you may be here and God's been dealing with you about joining the church. This would be the time that you could come forward and make that known. Would you stand with me? I want to pray with you. Then we're going to respond. Father God, we thank you for the day. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that we, we can change. You cannot change, but we can change. By the power of your Holy Spirit as he's dealing with our heart and our life, through the power of the word of God that accomplishes what you sent it to accomplish. God, through faith, we can change. And when we come to you, we find that you're unchanged and you're faithful. You will do what you said you'd do. And we can count on that. And God, I'm praying right now to people here that aren't saved, you give them the courage to take you at your word and they'll find you faithful. The believers here that are struggling with some stronghold in their life, Lord, give them the courage to give it to you right now because they'll find that you're faithful. And God, give us the courage to do what you'd have us to do for the glory of Jesus. Would you come?